to our service, let's pray together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen reminding ourselves of the summary of the law. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbors as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts, that we may obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in His presence to give thanks for the great benefits we've received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. Praying together, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we have ought to have done, and we've done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults, 
Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, desires not the death of sinners, but that they may turn from their wickedness and live. He has empowered and commanded his ministers to pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardons and absolves all who truly repent and sincerely believe his holy gospel. For this reason, we beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that our present deeds may please him, the rest of our lives may be pure and holy, and then at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's say together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to the Word of God. The first reading is taken from Genesis chapter 11. At one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. They began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone and tar was used for mortar. Then they said, Come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united, and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. In that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world, and they stopped building the city. That is why the city was called Babel, because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. 
And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Pyrigia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and all the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This wonderful painting was done in the 1500s by Peter Bruegel, and it is an example of Dutch and Flemish Renaissance painting. It is taken from the biblical account of the Tower of Babel. Many artists of that day would take their inspiration from the Bible. However, they would give it a modern flavor by mixing images from their own day. So, for example, you'll notice in the background a city, which is dwarfed by the tower. The sense of scale is provided by the Flemish-style port city, which is impressively tiny in comparison to the tower. There's even a, a castle in the background there. You'll also notice in the painting that there are sections of the tower that are completed. At the same time, there are parts falling down and have scaffolding trying to hold up the structure. And of course, this is part of the message. It is absolutely loaded with activity. So with meticulous precision and encyclopedic interest, Bruegel depicts an abundance of technical and mechanical details from the supply of the building materials in the busy harbor to the various cranes and the scaffolding on the unfinished brick foundation. But my favorite part of the painting is here in the bottom left section. I have a close-up here. And I think this is getting at the heart of the message of the painting from the biblical text. You see, a king appears as the primary builder along with his entourage at the bottom left of the painting. And some of the workers who are chiseling stone for the tower are actually bowing down to worship this man slash king. The focus is obviously on the king instead of giving proper glory to God. You'll notice how the tower reaches up to the clouds. However, it is optically distorted and appears to have slightly sunk into the ground on the left side. It is leaning to the left. No political pun intended. And this is an artistic gesture. On the one hand, enhancing, enhancing the impression of the tower's momentous nature, on the other hand, alluding to the human ego and the impossibility of completing the tower because the Lord will confuse the language of all the earth. I like to look at this painting and really examine it. It's almost like a Where's Waldo kind of thing. There's so much to look at. And that also is part of the message of the painting. So if we had the time, you could actually take a closer look. You would find yourself almost drawn into it, looking for more and more things in the painting. In addition to telling and showing the biblical story, Bruegel uses his painting as a social and political commentary on the world of his day. Each section of the painting is worthy of close scrutinization. 
And the observer must ask if Bruegel was painting today in Canada, how would he transpose the account for the contemporary viewer? What details would he include? Would the tower be located in Ottawa or Toronto? Would you see the CN Tower, for example, or the Rogers Centre? What other things would he paint into the picture? Let's pray before we take a look at our passages for the day. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, if we were to sum up the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, it would go something like this. The book of Genesis tells us how everything began from humanity's history to the world we know today. We would call this the problem statement for humanity. One, the rest of the Bible will be answering. It reveals a dramatic prologue. God creates. In the beginning, God created everything and God sees it all as good. In other words, God loves his creation. God loves us, humanity. However, as you know, soon the tragedy of sin infects the human race, resulting in Adam and Eve expelled from the garden, and as the story continues, culminating in the Tower of Babel, where people try to displace God from his righteous throne, and as a result, are expelled from that place as well. And so the conclusion is, we need a righteous king to save and rescue us. So let's take a look at the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. At one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. Now, on first inspection, you would think that having a universal language ought to be a good thing. But instead of acknowledging God, they try something else. And notice how the story shows a people moving away to the east. Now, if you remember, when Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden, they go east of Eden. And I think the Bible is suggesting here a rebellious people. They are literally moving away from the direction of God. Babel means gate of God. And Babylon considered itself closer to God than anywhere else on earth. It regarded itself as the religious, intellectual, and cultural capital of the ancient world, the showpiece of human civilization. But the truth is that their tower was more likely a temple or ziggurat. Historically speaking, these large ancient towers were built throughout that area of the world as a way to honor the heavens. And some scholars believe that the Tower of Babel was one of the first to be built. They were often used as a way to worship creation itself and were connected to astrology and even occult worship. According to historians, these towers would usually serve as a gateway to the heavens. Worshippers believed these towers to be a place where heaven and earth would meet. Listen to some of the conversation of the people. Verse 3, they said, Come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. We'll stop there for a moment. Human technology our ability to do the unthinkable has always fascinated people. And history is full of these accomplishments, the Great Pyramids, the, the, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. 
two examples of people thinking they are doing the unimaginable. Now, these things are not bad in themselves, of course, but I think the issue here is about the attitude that is behind it. Listen to the rest of the verse. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. Another translation says it a bit better. Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we would be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. In the original Hebrew language, it is, let us make a Shem for ourselves. Shem is the word for name. And unlike in our culture, a person's name wasn't just a means of identification. A person's name referred to their reputation. It was what they stood for. This building up of the tower was a form, as it were, of idol worship. Or perhaps think of it like this. I guess we all have a tendency to fear anonymity. And this gives us an inclination to build something that at least says that we were here. Let us make a name for ourselves. And I think it's fair to say that much of our culture is very concerned about building a self-image. By that, I mean that often people endeavor to project an image for others to see and remember them by. Buying certain brand name clothes because these clothes project an image of success or that fancy car that says something about the one who's driving it. And I just wonder how much money goes into building an image in North America. Let us make a name for ourselves. These problems have been and continue to be ones that still haunt the human race. We want to be heard, seen, noticed, marveled at, and remembered. And of course, we need to learn that life is not about ourselves and working towards just selfish ends. It's about being useful to God for His purposes. As mentioned, the problem is not so much in the tower, but the builders try to do this so that they can reach God. And can we say that perhaps they're thinking that by their works, they could reach God? If only I'm good enough, achieve enough, smart enough, rich enough, make a name for myself, I can reach God. So, the building of that tower was a fleshly attempt to maintain their legacy and preserve their posterity for generations apart from God. Now, in the original Hebrew, the reason given as to why God was displeased is because it says, verse 1, now the people had one language. People uh, had one Echad is the word, and echad is the Hebrew word for one, and it's the same words, word used in the verse, the Lord our God, the Lord is echad, one. So, while you would normally consider oneness to be a positive quality, in this case, God was against it. Why? Answer, very simple. It was not God-approved oneness. It was more about them than about, than about Almighty God. And peace without God, anything without God, is no peace at all. As the story continues, we're going to see that there is a warning here that when we focus our attention on making a name for ourselves, it will often end up in disaster. Verse 5, But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Now just think of it. The tower's top is in the sky where, assuming, God lives. We finally have the technology and the wisdom and the money and political power. But from God's perspective, it is in fact microscopic. God has to come down. 
Verse 6, look, he said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Now, what's going on here? Well, I don't think God is nervously, you know, biting his nails, threatened, but he is upset because their hearts are showing all the signs of hardness. Come, let us go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. In that way, God scattered them all over the world and they stopped building the city. That is why the city was called Babel, because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. And so the uh, judgment on the people is they are scattered all over the earth. But what I'd like to stress is that in this scattering, we actually see the grace of God. While it's true that God used language to confuse the people, he would ultimately use language to connect us once again as the kingdom of God. And so now we fast forward to the New Testament and the day of Pentecost. And what would be the perfect opposite to what occurred at the Tower of Babel? Well, the answer would be the day of Pentecost. And so do you see the contrast with the Tower of Babel? At the Tower of Babel, the human spirit was the driving force behind the construction of the tower. Let us make a name for ourselves. However, on the day of Pentecost, it was the Holy Spirit that was a driving and powerful force. One human spirit resulted in disarray. The Holy Spirit, on the other hand, resulted in unity. Interestingly, in both cases, God used language to achieve his purposes. In the first instance, he used different languages to foil the plans of men. In the second instance, he used different languages to bring people together. So the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 8. And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites, visitors from Rome, etc. We hear them telling in our own language the mighty works of God. And so throughout the New Testament, God used the gift of tongues or different languages in many different mighty ways. It demonstrated, first of all, that someone had the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it also revealed that the Gentiles had received the same gift as the Jewish believers. And so the gospel spread in ways that were never thought possible as people shared the good news of Jesus in every tongue. On the day of Pentecost, God took something that once caused confusion and transformed it into something beautiful yet powerful. While the Tower of Babel separated humanity through language, God would ultimately use language on the day of Pentecost to bring us together in him. What happened at the Tower of Babel was a representation of God's mercy and his ultimate plan for salvation. And of course, the plan was Jesus. It was always Jesus. And in his love, he put a hindrance between us so that our sin wouldn't be the end of us. We must not forget that God had a plan to unify us in him. God saw the bigger picture in Genesis chapter 11, one where we would worship him eventually in every language imaginable. So you can imagine what that must sound like in heaven. So how did God bring us from the Tower of Babel to the day of Pentecost? It was through the death and the resurrection of Jesus our Savior. 
He would be the one to set us free from sin and death. And he would be the one to unify us once again as the children of God when he poured out his Holy Spirit upon all people. Even way back in the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, where humanity is arrogantly trying to make a name for themselves, God's response, as always to human pride and arrogance, is to overturn the project, which he did by confusing their languages so that they could not understand one another and could not therefore work together on creating a human society which would have actually no need anymore for a creator God. And so God initiated a brilliant plan to win us back from the clutches of darkness. And he does this by passing down a covenant blessing. How so? Well, in the very next chapter, Genesis chapter 12, through Abraham and his family, including Isaac and Jacob and other individuals, in order to bless all of the families of the earth. These descendants will become the foundation for the nation of Israel and, of course, Jesus, the Messiah, who will bring salvation for all of humanity. And so on the day of Pentecost, the curse of the Tower of Babel is overturned. In other words, God is dramatically signaling that his promises to Abraham are being fulfilled. And the whole human race is going to be given the good news about Jesus. And it all happens when the Holy Spirit of God is poured out, enabling people to speak in other languages. And so it's hardly surprising that on the day of Pentecost, that to some people, though, it always is, like this, it sounded like slurred and babbling speech of people who had had too much alcohol to drink. Again and again in the Bible, we find people in opposition to the things of God. And so we shouldn't be surprised if the same thing is happening in our day as well. We live, as you know, in very, very confusing and often very godless activity taking over our culture. What will it take to bring renewal and revival into our land right now? Obviously, the answer is this. Another mighty, mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit in us and in the culture around us. You'll notice that in the story of the day of Pentecost, this all happened in the context of prayer. They were gathered to pray, to wait on the Lord. And as I've often said, waiting is activity in the kingdom of God when we turn our attention to the living God. So let's pray right, right now. Father, I thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, that from that moment the church was birthed. Lord, I thank you that we are sitting here today because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and we know that we need your help in us personally, in your church, and in the culture around us. We say that ancient prayer, come, Holy Spirit, this day, fill us anew with your grace, your power, and your love. And we would ask all of these things in the very, very strong name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Continue by praying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And please join me in praying a prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory 
throughout all ages. Amen. Waiting for Messiah to come, sitting on my garden wall, balancing, trying not to fall down. Looking at the world today, listen to what people say, dancing to the tune that they play. Rushing wind and tongues of fire, knock me down, spoil my composure. Jesus lives and the church is born, I'm falling off my garden wall. Waiting till the time is right, do not want to die of fright, balancing, try not to fall down. Seeking through the light so dim, opening my heart to him, dancing to the tune that he sings. Rushing wind and tongues of fire, knock me down, spell my composure. Jesus lives and the church is born. of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful week.